Hi there. Have you ever been left bewildered how some people write chemical formulas very easily? For example, someone might write calcium phosphate like this. This is Z Online School. And in this video, we'll be talking about how to write chemical formulas. By the end of this video, you should be able to know what a chemical formula is, how to use atoms to make a chemical formula, how to use valences of the elements in a certain compound to make a chemical formula. And at the end of this video, we've got some bonus tips for you that will help you stand out and rarely get questions under chemical formulas wrong. We're going to start with knowing what a chemical formula is. We can start writing about chemical formulas without really defining them. The easiest definition is that a chemical formula is just a way of writing a compound using symbols. Instead of writing everything in full words of that element in the compound, we use symbols that are indicated on the periodic table. Therefore, if you want to know the full definition of a chemical formula, it's just a representation used to express the ratio by which elements in a compound or molecule are bonded together. If you see, there's the word ratio there. Therefore, a chemical formula will show the same ratio for the same compound. For example, let's say we had sodium oxide. This is how sodium oxide would be written by anyone who knows how to write chemical formulas. Ask your teacher, ask any friend who knows how to write chemical formulas, they should give you this. Another example is water, which we usually drink. Right now, you can even pause the video and take a glass to refresh. Eh? Another example is calcium silicate. So chemical formulas range from very simple to very complex. Now, let's look at some methods we can use to write these chemical formulas. The first is using number of atoms. This is the easiest and the basic way in which someone can understand how we write chemical formulas. What do we mean when we say using the number of atoms? Well, what we mean is we'll carry out a certain four step procedure and then get our chemical formula. As you can read, the first step is identifying elements. Which elements are we going to identify? The elements that are in that specific chemical compound or molecule. Whenever we're starting to write the chemical formula, whether you use this method of number of atoms or the one for valences, the first step is always finding the elements. You can't write a chemical formula if you haven't been given the elements. Secondly, in this method, what we do is sketch a bonding structure of those elements. Third, we just observe the number of atoms for each element. And last but not the least is generating the formula. Enough of the steps, let's look at an example of how we can write sodium chloride with this method. In this method, writing sodium chloride will be very easy because we can draw the structure of sodium and the structure of chlorine, which is in its ionic form being called chloride. Very simple, right? Yeah. Okay, sodium will be drawn like this. If you've watched our video on ionic bonding, this one be very difficult. While chloride, which is just chlorine, will be drawn like this. You can notice we haven't put any charges here. We haven't even shown the innermost shell, which is the first energy shell. We've just shown the outermost shell. Remember, this is a sketch. We just want to know how the atoms are being distributed, okay? You just want to know how many atoms of sodium will be there, how many atoms of chlorine will be there. So we can see they're just one and both of them are stable. There's one sodium and one chlorine. Therefore, writing our formula will be very simple. We won't add any numbers. It will just be NaCl. I'm sure you've seen this formula being used to represent sodium chloride somewhere. This is one of the most used chemical formulas in chemistry, sodium chloride. To get this sink in your mind, we're going to do another example where we're looking at carbon dioxide. 
if you can notice, the first one was an ionic bond. Now this one is a covalent bond. Well, to do that, you can also check our video under covalent bonding. It's very simple. Another way people might write the chemical formula for this specific compound is using the prefix di. When you see the prefix di, it means two oxide. If you see mono, it means one of that particular element. However, we can also represent this using our atoms. We're going to draw the covalent bonds between these two elements. You agree with me, carbon dioxide will be drawn like this. And now we see how many carbon atoms we have. If you can see, we only have one, while we have two oxygen atoms. Therefore, our chemical formula will be written as CO2. The two shows that we've got two oxygen atoms. Very simple. Now, right here is where things become tricky for some people. This two are writing shouldn't be the same size as the O. It should be smaller and at the bottom of the O. It shouldn't be at the top, please. It should be at the bottom. Then it should come after that element you want to show the number of atoms for. If it comes before the O, you're saying there are two atoms of carbon. With that said and done, now let's look at the limitations of this method. The first limitation is that this method is not so fast. It's difficult to make chemical formulas involving transitional metals using this method. And it also proves to be very difficult to make formulas involving radicals. These three things are basically the limitation of only relying on this method. This method is usually shown to students that are taught to just give them an understanding of how chemical formulas come about. After they are comfortable with that, then they'll be shown the second way of making chemical formulas. Now, how do we use the second method where we make use of valencies? It's very simple, but before we do it, let's get a clear picture of what a valency really is. Valency is just the combining power of an element and usually to be linked to something on the periodic table, we'll know it just in some seconds. What I want you to see is that in this periodic table, we've only shown part of the 20 elements. We haven't included their atomic masses. We've only shown their atomic numbers. You can see the elements from 1 to 20, hydrogen, helium, and up to 20, which is calcium. Now, you should understand that the valency of a metal is simply the number of electrons it will be giving out for it to be stable. While the valency of a non-metal is the number of electrons it will receive for it to become stable. With those two principles, you are home and dry. Now, why did I bring this periodic table over here for you to see? Well, this periodic table has a trick like I told you about valencies. Group 1, 2, 3, and 4 have got the valencies 1 for group 1. In group 2, the valency is 2. In group 3, the valency is 3, and in group 4, the valency is 4. Now, from group 5, going to group 6 and group 7, these are non-metals. Therefore, what happens is just the opposite of how the numbers were increasing on the left side. So group 5 will have the valency 3, because it needs 3 electrons to be stable. Group 6 will have the valency 2 because it needs two electrons to be stable. Group 7 will have the valency 1 because it needs one electron to be stable. While the last group here, which is group O, the noble gases, or group 8, won't be considered in chemical equations because these elements found in this group are usually stable. Therefore, they rarely participate in chemical reactions. This is how valencies come about. So if you forget your valences, just remember the periodic table is a very handy tool to remember which 
elements have which valences. To find valences, we also just carry out four steps. The first, like I said, is identification of the elements. The second in this method is finding the valency for each element. The third is swapping the valences. This is the key of using this method. Just the swap. You master the swap, you master this method. The fourth is generating the formula just like we had in the previous method. And with these four steps, you will be home and dry about finding the chemical formula for various elements combined. With these four steps, you will be able to find the chemical formulas for various elements combined. This is one of the fastest ways in which we can write a chemical formula. Let's say we had aluminium oxide. How do we write aluminium oxide? The first is that we get the atom of aluminium and try to draw it. And we get the atom of oxygen and try to draw it. We already know that method, but how do we do it with valences? Okay. If you have a periodic table, pause the video. If you don't, just rewind the video a bit till you see the periodic table that we just showed you. Aluminium is represented by Al, while oxygen as O. Aluminium is a metal, you agree with me. Therefore, it will give away electrons to become stable. And that number of electrons it will give away is its valency. Oxygen is a non-metal. So the electrons it's going to receive is its charge or its valency. Now, it means that aluminium will have three and oxygen will have two. We're done with step two, which is finding the valencies for each element. Now, if you use the periodic table, you will be able to see that just using the groups like I showed you, will give you these valencies. Step three is swapping these valencies. What do we mean? It means the valency three will be used as the number of atoms for oxygen and the valency two will be used as the number of atoms for aluminium. Therefore, aluminium oxide will be Al2 or three. Aluminium oxide is a very interesting compound. You even know more properties about it as we learn more things in chemistry. Aluminium oxide is a very special compound. As we go on, you will be able to know more about aluminium oxide. Now, what are the things and tips that you need to know about chemical formulas? The first thing as you can read here is how to work with transitional metals. Most people find it difficult when they are asked to find the chemical formula involving transitional metals. Why? Because the first thing is that they don't know where transitional metals are. Or maybe they don't know what a transitional metal is. But thanks you came to this video, you're going to know what a transitional metal is. A transitional metal might be sometimes just referred to as a transitional element. It is just simply a certain element that has got various valences. Therefore, it doesn't have one specific valency. It has got multiple. If you can see, it's those elements that are in between group 2 and group 3. It's rare that hydrogen will be considered a transitional metal. However, those below hydrogen are, for example, scandium, titanium, vanadium, and many others. You encounter questions asking you to find chemical formulas involving iron, copper, zinc, silver, and many other transitional elements. Not all of them will be found in your questions, but those I've mentioned, you sometime or someday encounter a question involving them. Those are transitional elements. Now, let's look at an example. Ion 3 oxide is an example of a compound involving a transitional metal. You can see we've got ion there, a 3 that we'll talk about very soon, and an oxide. Therefore, we've got ion and oxygen. Now, the question that gets many people confused is what is the valency of ion when we're given such a compound? It's very simple. 
It's just in that number in the brackets. 3. Oxygen is just one of those elements found on the periodic table in group 6. Therefore, it's got the valency 2. Next is swapping. But before we swap, I would like to share with you this table here. It's very helpful. Some of you might have forgotten your Roman numerals. You can see the different distribution of Roman numerals from numbers 1 to 10. You can pause the video and copy this if you like. There's no problem. And you can use it to remember which Roman numeral represents which number. With that said and done, you agree with me that the chemical formula for iron 3 oxide is Fe2 or 3. Another example is silver 2 chloride. Okay, we just do the same things. What you just need to know is how silver is indicated in abbreviation. It's not SI. If you write SI, you'll be talking about silicon, and that will be also wrong. So remember, silver is AG. You can check the periodic table for now. But as you get used, these chemical symbols will get to your heart and you remember them easily now these two will just swap and we have our chemical formula for silver 2 chloride very simple with this said and done there's one thing left before we just finish this lesson sometimes you find questions involving radicals or maybe you don't even know which questions involve radicals so let's talk about them before we close this lesson Radicals are compounds like this shown in this diagram. In definition, radicals are just a group of elements that cannot exist independently. So their chemical properties are as a group. You can see each of them are a group of two or more elements. They cannot be made of one element. From ammonium to phosphate, you can see each of them is made up of a group of elements. All of these are radicals. And now what you do is pause the video, copy this table and know all of them. Each of them has got a specific valency and each of them has got a specific charge. Their charge is just simply being either positive or negative. But it's very easy to remember because we know ammonium is the only positively charged radical that you should remember. In this table, we've added bicarbonate and dichromate for you, which are less common to be seen in questions. But you never know what happens. You need to know them also. With that said and done, now let's look at some examples. Sodium bicarbonate is a nice compound. It's used in fire extinguishers, meaning it's used to stop fire. Sometimes this same sodium bicarbonate might be used in effervescent drinks, which are just simply fizzy drinks or carbonated drinks, depending on which name you might know them. The principle is still the same. And like I said, the second method is usually preferred because the first one is long. Bicarbonate is HCO3. I'm sure you copied the table and this won't be much of a problem. Okay, nice and easy. These two valencies are going to swap and we're going to have our chemical formula for sodium bicarbonate. You can see these chemical formulas are now getting to look complex, but now you know how to even come up with these complex chemical formulas. I'm sure by now you can even write calcium phosphate we just talked about at the start of this lesson, right? Let's look at another example. Calcium hydroxide. Hydroxide is OH. I like hydroxide. Why? Because it's very easy to remember. Hydroxide. Yeah, it's O. Hydroxide. Yeah, very simple to remember. Now, what I want you to see is that the 2 there is now affecting hydroxide, right? How do we write it now? What I'll just tell you is this simple principle. Whenever you're writing a radical and you've got a certain number more than 1, 
that is being taken as the number of atoms what you just do is put brackets around that radical and then put the number outside the brackets and with that you'll be home and dry this is how calcium hydroxide should be written you get it correct if you write it like this thanks for reaching to the end of this video now your job is to see if you can join a transitional metal and a radical See you in another video. See you in another video. See you in another video.